Hello, welcome to How to Flourish in a New Era of E-Commerce. Um, very quickly, I'll run through a couple of key points about us as an agency. So who are we? We're a digital performance marketing agency. We blend human ingenuity with data to build you powerful strategies and high quality execution to help you grow. Um, and we're powered by one of the most unique characteristics in the digital agency landscape, and that is the ability to develop and activate data-driven digital marketing strategies in any market in the world. Our localization engine as part of WeLocalize gives us genuinely unique, scalable, efficient offering in the digital space that's almost unrivaled for smart competitors internationally. The services that we offer, these services um, are supported by our connected strategy and data teams um, to make sure that we deliver on our promise to you as our clients and help you grow your business. And before we get started today, just very quickly, the recording is coming tomorrow. Um, so as ever, we want you to have easy access to all of our content. Um, so look out for that in your inbox tomorrow morning. Um, any questions, um, please give them to us throughout today. So if something pops into your mind as any of the team are presenting, just share them um, through the app. And then as we get towards the end, we'll host a QA and a um, if questions come in throughout. Um, and get in touch as well. So if you ever need anything or you have any questions after the event, then you can email us at hello at adaptworldwide.com. So what are we covering? So just very quick housekeeping from me, and then I'll give you a 10 minute session just on our view um, broadly from a high level on e-commerce in 2021. Then I'm going to pass over to the shopping team in paid media um, to talk, talk through how to flourish in this new era and then we'll follow that up for with an organic point of view as well from Haseeb. Um, what's next? So as, as ever, our content continues to flow and to help everybody understand what's happening in the market. And the next session that we have is how data feed management drives e-commerce success. It's quite specific, but it's a 60 minute webinar. And we, we dive into the basics of feed management, but also um, explore advanced optimization tactics um, that will really help make your data feeds um, a key part of your e-commerce growth in the future. So what's our view? What's our view on the industry at the moment? There's a, there's a really feel-good sentiment um, across the industry currently, a feeling that the corner might finally have been turned, that the current rate of ad spending growth is likely to be the fastest in the post-war era, according to Group M, who are a, a brilliant metric on this. Um, and it comes with a lot of companies had severely cut back, obviously, um, on marketing expenses in the early months of the pandemic. Um, and major players in digital advertising are benefiting from this. So large corporations like Google and Facebook, but also the likes of Snap, Pinterest, are getting an ever-growing share of spend. There's absolutely no question which is the chart on the right, that digital is taking an ever-growing share um, and nobody expected the numbers that we saw to come out of Google in Q1. Their first quarter of revenues of 55.2 billion represented a staggering 34% jump in the first quarter of 2020 and, and advertising was 32% up year over year at 44.6 billion as a share of their revenues and the, the remainder of that really coming from cloud and other services that they have. And Facebook's particularly interesting for us at the moment as well, that their growth was largely driven by product verticals, such as online commerce, and an increase in demand from small and medium-sized advertisers. Um, and their attack towards commerce, which is highly relevant to today, is really noticeable. Facebook have been positioning in this way for quite a while, so accelerated by the, by the pandemic, obviously, but their marketplace, um, which I'm sure everybody's aware of, has a billion monthly users now. They have a digital currency, DM, digital wallets, Navy, uh, and they're really focused at the minute on developing ease of payment um, to improve ROI for developers and try and increase engagement on their platform. And their business API on WhatsApp driven, delivered 100 million messages a day, uh, which was 40% up at the height of the pandemic. Um, so they're, they're seeing incredible growth at the minute, and obviously Amazon is as well. Their growth has predominantly come from AI-driven ad relevancy, really pushing up ad sales. 
Um, we have regulatory headwinds, obviously, um, ad targeting headwinds, um, mostly on account of shifting regulatory positions and tech shifts, uh, most notably from Apple. Um, you may have seen uh, in the news that they've released their privacy changes, and we've written a lot of content on this as well, in iOS 14, that will make it harder for companies like us um, and you to target ads to consumers and track performance. And you know, our aim with this is to really be a leading voice for our clients on this subject to guide you through the changes that you need to make and add value for you our clients um, look out for our events on third-party cookies um, coming up with iab which is going to be absolutely fantastic in the coming weeks um, but as a summary overall a really buoyant industry mood going into half two of this year um, and, and really in 2020 we saw 10 years growth in just three months so COVID obviously accelerated trends in our industry at a fairly unprecedented level. And you can see in the chart on the right-hand side that pretty much across every single market, e-commerce penetration as a percentage of retail sales grew a phenomenal amount, really. Um, and it's the widely held view that this is going to stick, um, that we won't slip back to exactly where we were previously. And that, that's quite well represented um, through the ONS, this is freely available to everybody, but it's a great um, way to monitor internet sales as a percentage of retail sales, so what's being driven through e -com. And you can see in the slide here that from 2016, there was a steady growth, um, with obviously the spikes around Christmas, but as soon as we hit COVID-19 and the pandemic, between January 20 and April 20, it grew a huge 10 percentage points, the 20 to 30 percent roughly as a share of retail sales. Um, now, the, the question really is for us as an agency and for our clients is how much is that going to slip back? Um, and we had an indication of that sort of in the middle of last year, so just late summer, um, when, when really the country was predominantly open in the UK. Um, and we, we slipped back to 26.4% um, in September, so nowhere near where we were at the end of 2019. And the, the industry is really predicting that this will continue in future years as well. So um, towards the bottom of the text there, you can see the percentage growth that um, is being predicted through to 2024. So back to the same level of growth that we've seen from 2016 but we're going to maintain the momentum um, of people switching to e-com um, and internet sales that we've we've seen throughout the pandemic so at a very high level what are the five trends what, what are the things that will shape your future our future um, the e-commerce boom has fueled record competition so what we just talked about with delivering um, growth through the pandemic was, was really fueled um, in a competitive sense by legacy wholesalers, global retail giants, um, product categories not traditionally purchased online were driving up customer acquisition costs and loss of markets. And really the key call out on this point is that many of the new competitors are not equipped to compete on customer experience. And, and that really is a top differentiator online. This gives us an edge the brands focused on immersive omnichannel experiences. And secondly, new behaviors are really reshaping the future of retail. So products rarely purchased online have become more popular. So think groceries, health, hygiene, home essentials. Um, and COVID-19 has really amplified the demand for immediacy and convenience. Um, whether that becomes permanent or not for retailers really depends on how their customers ultimately found their experience and re retailers are thinking about how they respond to that behavior shift, that demand, trying to like think about trying products on, for example, through augmented reality. They're really thinking about how they access their customers and get that customer experience up. Um, and thirdly, fulfillment emerged as a huge competitive differentiator that the brand of today um, and the future is ultimately delivering four key things. It's, it's fast, it's free, it's sustainable and it's branded shipping. So retailers are thinking about this at the minute. What are your shipping thresholds? At what point can you deliver for free to protect your product margin? Um, and they, ultimately, retailers consider fulfillment as a competitive advantage. 
They're trying to differentiate with proximity to customers, automating returns, pickup options. Fourthly, marketplaces. So everyone's aware of the, the likes of Amazon, um, but brand building is being challenged by marketplace dominance. So over 50% of sales now are driven through marketplaces. Um, people are searching for solutions, that's the key thing, and products, but not brands. So building your brand has never been more difficult, nor has it ever been more important. Um, and customers are increasingly socially conscious. They're willing to pay a premium for brands with a purpose. The retailers are building out marketplace pages into an, an, an immersive experience of their brand or as much as they can. Um, and another thing that they're doing as well is considering selling unique products through their own channels, not available on marketplaces to really add a differentiator. And finally, and my last point is retention. Um, it's a top priority as new customer acquisition costs increase due to that higher competition. And it's increasingly hard to target across channels, the regulatory headwinds that I mentioned earlier. So brands are focused on getting that first party data, getting that email address to build a relationship, and modeling that data. Um, and they're incentivizing customers um, like they never have before as well. Brands want to keep customers engaged. They've spent more to get them, so they want to keep them. And they're considering building out a social presence and, and also community building opportunities as well. So th those are the key trends that, that we're monitoring um, and helping our clients through. Um, hopefully that gives you a, a good high level summary of, of the kind of things that we're going to talk about today. Um, next, I'm going to pass you over to our wonderful shopping team, um, starting off with Nick and they're gonna run through with you in a lot more detail about how to flourish in a new era of e-commerce. Thank you, John. Hi hey everyone, uh, my name is Nick Crane. I'm the shopping lead at Adapt. And in this section, we are going to cover how to flourish in a new era of e-commerce from a paid media perspective. According to Euromonitor International, the UK is the third most penetrated e-commerce country across the globe beaten only by China and North Korea. This shows that the UK population is without question well accustomed to purchasing a good or service online. While John talked about the feel good sentiment across the industry, competition has never been so fierce. To succeed, brands need to continue to align and adapt to the market. At Adapt, the e-commerce team have a mantra that keeps us focused. Inspiration, conversion, and retention. Today we've broken this down into three sections. Firstly, I'll start with inspiration. Since the pandemic, the enforced lockdowns and retail closures have led to an increase in online shopping. This Google Trends chart shows the volume of ideas related searches since 2017. As you can see from the red line, which is last year, the lockdowns cause this activity to surge. From the blue line, it is clear that 2021 has averaged higher still. While Google has seen search increases across the board, it is generic non-branded search that has seen the most noticeable increase. On comparing the search volume for ideas pre and post pandemic, this has risen 20%. Essentially, window shopping is increasingly online. Here is my illustration of what window shopping is to become in the 2020s. The shop window on the high street may lessen in importance. While once loved, it is evolving to be predominantly within our phones in this mobile first world. Therefore, the pathway to inspiration, discovery and purchase will become increasingly fragmented in comparison to our current retail landscape. Shopping habits have fundamentally changed. Traditionally, people find products Increasingly, in the wake of discovery commerce, it will be the products finding the people. You'll likely have noticed the new entrant to the right of Snapchat, named Ooh, an app I'll touch on later, which is wanting to lead the next era of e-commerce. Google last week revealed Shopping Graph and its partnership with Shopify, hosting a new simplified process that will let Shopify's 1.7 million merchants feature their products across Google in just a few clicks. Shopping Graph is a dynamic AI enhanced model that understands a constantly changing set of products, sellers, brands, reviews, and inventory data Google receives from brands directly. 
two concrete steps Google have taken to support discoverability and inspiration for all merchants are eliminating commission fees and making it free for sellers on Google. For brands, initiatives such as Surfaces Across Google, which launched last year, offer free exposure to millions of people who come to Google every day for their shopping needs. Since the launch of this initiative, Google has seen a 70% increase in the size of its product catalog and an 80% increase in merchants on its platform. Evidence that Google is fighting back against Amazon in the battle for e-commerce dominance. Paid shopping will still produce the lion's share of volume. Of volume. The shopping graph will simply help to complement brand's marketing mix only further. Last week, Google announced other features design, designed to facilitate e-commerce for users. Increasingly, users will be able to search within a screenshot to browse Google for similar product inspiration. In this example, using Google Lens technology to find similar trainers to the ones pictured. Ahead of, ahead of attracting new customers, brands need to start by conducting an honest assessment of their existing social activity. This could be in the form of a social maturity assessment. On including a competitor analysis section, it will then become possible to determine the strengths, weaknesses and opportunities of your approach. Next, craft a social resilience and rollout plan with the aim of focusing on improving the newfound weaknesses and seizing opportunities in a methodical, phased and timely fashion. My advice, which is applicable for all social platforms, is to have one voice, refrain from copying your competitors and be human, personable and relatable. Innocent Drinks and Monzo Bank are perfect examples of this. Ten years ago, the go-to option for wide-reaching credibility was celebrity content. However, in my view, today this content looks increasingly artificial. The key to authenticity in the 2020s is influencer-led. To ensure, where increasingly appropriate, you have an influencer strategy. This could be in the form of customer-generated reviews or product imagery. On a grander scale, blogging, Instagram, Snapchats, TikToks, or other promoted content across the socials. With it being the year of the mobile for the last 10 years, I, I trust that you have that covered. My estimate is that 2022 will be the year, year of the influencer. Here are my tips for delighting your customers when they land on your site, all of which are interconnected. Build for browsing. Websites shouldn't just be transactional. Make it easy for, for your customers to window shop. Optimize on-site search relevancy. Weight search results with consideration to product relevancy and margin. Mix and match filters. Help to cut customer consideration phase by streamlining product selection. Mobile first. Brands typically receive the highest proportion of traffic through mobile. Therefore, pour your time and resources into mobile first. Make it fast. According to Google, 40% of customers will leave a page that takes longer than three seconds to load. Assets. The quality of your assets matters greatly. Check out a product page on Gymshark for a strong example of this. Virtual experiences. Live content can be authentic, such as behind the scenes tours, product seminars or influencer led sessions. Or on a grander scale, augmented reality, virtual product try on or placement within your home environment, like, like the new IKEA Place app offers. Up and cross sell strategies with the aim of supporting customer decision making and increasing, increasing basket size. As a final point, it is essential to not undervalue the impact of micro influencer customer generated content. It is important to act now to ensure your brand doesn't get left behind. According to the Financial Times, the UK economy is set to see the fastest growth rate in 70 years. And while everyone has been affected by the pandemic in different ways, UK household savings are at record highs. With restrictions thankfully lessening, pent up demand is predicted to fuel revenge spending. The idea is that consumers were shopping starved during the lockdowns and are overcompensating by splurging more than usual. One more thing. A new era of e-commerce is coming and therefore, after today, underinvesting in the socials is now at your own risk. Traditionally, inspiration has been on the socials, with the actual transaction then with, with the actual transaction then taking place on the brand's own website. The next e-commerce disruption is social commerce. 
the main difference being that the transaction also takes place on the socials. As John mentioned earlier, Facebook have been growing their e-commerce e offering for a while, with the launch of Facebook Pay to rival, to rival Apple Pay and Facebook and Instagram shops. Brands in the US are already testing its in-app checkout functionality. Facebook is also, is also piloting live shopping, which is a growing phenomenon of live streaming while featuring your products with the ability to add to bag. What is noticeable is that platforms are increasingly trying to keep customers within, our own eco within their own ecosystem with a view to reducing attribution anxiety and taking a share of overall revenue. Traditional commerce featured on the left and in the form of a website can arguably be seen as 2D, flat, static, uninspiring, while I am sure there are some innovators among you. An offshoot of social commerce is video commerce, which is aiming to completely reimagine the retail experience. Think QVC shopping, but for Generation Z. China have an entire series of video commerce apps that include the whole retail journey from inspiration to purchase. Here in the UK, check out Ooh, an app that offers free live influencer-led content with the ability to purchase within app. Last year, Shopify and TikTok announced a partnership so we can anticipate further developments here. Thank you for listening. Uh, moving on from inspiration, we will now hear from uh, Joe Johnston, uh, ADAPT's uh, lead conversion consultant. Thanks very much, Nick. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the conversion journey. Uh, a familiar sort of site on screen there, the funnel, but when people go through the conversion journey, they move through three distinct phases before purchase. And the more expensive or complex the product or service, the more time people need before they feel ready to commit. So it's essential that you consider each of these phases carefully and create a funnel that builds trust, develops relationships, and proves your expertise. So now I'm gonna give you some specific tips for each of these three phases. First of all, let's start with the top of the funnel, awareness. So these are new prospects. They may have likely never heard of your brand before, and they may be landing on your website for the very first time. And so Nick has, has just touched upon some of the ways to give a really great first impression, such as being mobile friendly and having really high quality assets. Uh, and actually, as, as a bit of a side note, a really great way to get some user feedback on first impressions is by using a tool uh, called Five Second Test. Uh, and the clue's in the name, really, but this is where users are shown a landing page for five seconds only and then asked to provide feedback on what they saw, which is a really, really good way to gather quick feedback on, on people's gut reaction to your website. However, my tip here is actually more of a technical one. So as most people hopefully will be aware by now, um, by August, Google will have rolled out its much-anticipated page experience updates to its algorithm. In short, these core web vitals are three metrics that measure page speed, interactivity, and visual stability. And they're really an attempt by Google to measure the on-page user experience. Um, and if you're still in any doubt about how much page experience, in particular page speed, can impact performance, uh, we recently carried out some analysis for a client where we found that conversion rate was actually 42% higher when the page speed was reduced from over three seconds to under two seconds. Uh, so if you're scoring poorly in any, any of these areas, you should definitely try and act fast to make those improvements before the deadline. And luckily, we have written a blog on the very subject. So you can uh, have a look at that and that will hopefully help you prepare uh, for the coming deadline. Okay, the next stage of the funnel is where those visitors start to show a bit of interest. So they've landed on their page on, on your website and they've, importantly, they've decided to stay, which is definitely obviously the first step is convincing people to stay. So they've started browsing and shopping. And now we're going to do a speed run through six key cognitive biases. And hopefully you can take this slide away and sound very impressive to your colleagues when you start casually dropping into conversation bits of behavioral psychology. Uh, so we're gonna take them one by one. The first one is category heuristics. Uh, and this 
essentially appeals to people's need for simplification. So the key takeaway here is make sure you have short descriptions of your key product categories because they're going to help simplify purchase decisions for your customers and, and essentially make something that's complex uh, and, and easier um, an easier sell. Number two is the power of now or the next day delivery phenomenon. So essentially the longer you have to wait for a product, the weaker the proposition becomes. So if you can shorten that time lag between buying and receiving a product, you're going to lower a common barrier to conversion. Number three, social proof. Uh, essentially what this boils down to is we're more likely to do something when we're presented with evidence that others have already done it. The, the key thing here is recommendations and reviews from others, uh, which are, are going to be very, very persuasive. Number four, scarcity bias, or as I like to call it, the toilet roll phenomenon, um, for more recent evidence of, of how this actually works. So as stock or availability of a product decreases, uh, the more desirable it becomes. So limited editions or time-sensitive offers can be very, very powerful incentives. Number five, authority bias. People look to sources of authority as shortcuts to decision-making. So that's why quoting experts or trusted third-party sources such as publications uh, or micro-influencers can be very, very persuasive. Number six, the power of free. So this doesn't just have to be a free gift. Everyone loves a free gift, right? But And that can be a very powerful motivator. But actually, perhaps even more compelling than that can sometimes just be free delivery. Uh, and that can be a very, very tempting proposition. Okay, so if you're trying to improve your on-site conversion, just don't make the mistake of approaching it from the wrong direction. So... It's great to know about these cognitive biases, but they aren't a one size fits all solution. First of all, you really need to understand why your customers are behaving in the way they do with your specific products. And the best way to do this is by understanding where users are abandoning in the first place using web analytics. Uh, so if you could please uh, click the next slide, please, Nick. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, what we're trying to do here is essentially understand uh, where people are dropping off in the first place. Um, and through more qualitative-based research, like user testing or surveys, we can understand why they're behaving in that way. So for example, um, you may find customers are dropping off at the payment detail stage. And after observing users and listening to their feedback, you may find that they need a final bit of reassurance about your delivery and returns policy to remove any final hesitation. Okay, so the next stage of the funnel, sale. This is where shoppers are ready to buy. And this next tip really is quite straightforward. So customers expect payment to be quick and secure and they, and they expect to have a choice of known payment providers that they can trust. Um, a recent example from a client is that they essentially simplified their payment details page uh, in a redesign and they tested removing some key payment logos such as mastercard and visa but they kept paypal and they also removed the credit payment option um, and maybe unsurprisingly the conversion rate dropped but it did drop by a, a significant 60 percent so this really highlights people's need for choice uh, and they also need to see known providers when it comes to payment to make it easy for them So that was a real whistle stop tour and hopefully this has given you some food for thought about where you can start to make improvements. However, it's important to keep in mind that optimization isn't just a one-time fix. It definitely requires continuous incremental improvements and consistent effort over time. So I'm just gonna leave you with some final quick fire bonus tips. So these are some of the top reasons why users might be leaving your website and how you may address them. Um, so we often find that users are looking for reviews or evidence of other, other people using the product. They may be looking for a discount or voucher code. They might actually be just waiting for payday, or they just need to see the image in higher resolution or see a better product description before they decide to commit to paying. So the good thing is it's within your power to provide all of these things and keep your valuable prospects on site. So 
those are my top tips for converting customers. And now Sam is going to talk a little bit about how to keep them. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam, um, and I'm here to be talk you through retention strategies. So as we know, over the last 15 months, we have all seen a huge increase in online sales in the UK. Uh, here, in the, here in the UK, online sales grew by 36.6% year on year in 2020. This e-commerce boom has seen waves of new users buying online. Since the start of the pandemic, 46% of UK customers purchased a product online that they had previously only ever purchased in store. 32% of customers believe their habits of buying online are going to change on a permanent basis. This is obviously great news for e-commerce businesses, but with the high street opening up, it is entirely possible that we do see a shift away from e-commerce as we did in the summer of 2020. All these new customers are great, but with the threat of the high street returning, it is now more important than ever to focus on retaining the growth that we have seen over the last year. As the situation moves forward, every business should have a retention strategy. If we lose the customers that we have gained over the last year, we simply lose all that growth. With more and more businesses rushing to e-commerce, we have seen them rush to digital advertising platforms. This increase in competition has led to custom acquisition costs rising. So by having a retention strategy, you can save money on marketing by focusing on a known audience that has already shown uh, intent, intent to buy. If these customers buy again, then we increase the lifetime value of each one, making each customer more profitable. The more profitable a customer is, the less we have to worry about the cost of acquisition. Therefore, improving your retention strategy opens you up to be more aggressive in acquiring, acquiring new customers. Your most loyal customers also just simply spend more money. New customers typically have a lower average order value because they don't know whether they like your products and they don't know whether to trust you. Your more loyal customers are often more than happy to spend a bit more money once you've established that relationship with them. Loyal customers are often happy to shout about how great their experiences have been with their family, friends and family. So think about how you can incentivize those users to share their positive experiences through online platforms. Furthermore, it may be possible that your most loyal customers can be utilized and turned into a sales team through things like referral schemes. Incentivizing these customers in this way could be one of the cheapest customer acquisition strategies available to you. Finally, it's important to listen to these customers. What do they like? What didn't they like? Their feedback on their on your products and services is invaluable and should be listened to. It's going to help shape your business moving forward. It's important to see your customers as individuals as they're all different and the simplest way to retain these customers is to make them happy. Customers, including myself, are extremely needy. I know I certainly need constant reassurance when I buy something. If I don't receive a confirmation email within seconds, I immediately start to panic. So ensure you have a quick, honest, post-purchase communication process in place that notifies the user at each step of the journey. On top of this, the top three things customers want to see is prompt delivery. So if you're not offering next day delivery, it should definitely be something to consider. There's also complaint handling and good packaging. So that's anything from protective packaging to sustainable packaging to pretty boxes. Like I already mentioned, reward your most loyal customers. Make it an easy decision for them to buy again by offering things like loyalty points or VIP access to new products or promotions. 15% of online shoppers receive products that they have bought online on a regular basis. Offering subscriptions could be a great way to encourage users to buy again and increase their lifetime value. As I already said, your customers are individuals. So think about what they will buy next. Will they buy your product again? Will they buy something else? 
use the data you have available to you to get the right messaging in front of them, to get them back on site and back into the purchase funnel. Organically, there is an opportunity to engage your customers as part of your retention strategy by posting regularly and engaging with users. You can build an online community around your brand, which creates a new level of loyal customers. Your customers are likely to be everywhere online and you should be too. So it's important to get your brand and products in front of your best customers wherever they are online to maintain brand awareness and ensure you are front of mind. Use your data to make sure you have your messaging on point. Do your customers want to see generic brand messaging or can you predict future behavior based on the data that you have? With some of these ad platforms becoming more expensive, there is an opportunity to test other less competitive and cheaper platforms for your upper funnel activity. This allows you to focus on retention and bottom of the funnel activity on the more competitive platforms. These ad platforms are going to behave differently for everyone, so it's important to remain flexible and have your own strategy and KPIs for each individual platform. The way we use data is changing all the time. Second party data isn't something that we use that often day to day, and third party data is, is going to become less and less accessible in the future with the death of the cookie. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this now. If you want more information on this, uh, there's a, Ryan's got a blog post on the website. There's also the webinar coming up on the 16th of June on how to prepare for life after third party cookies. For retention, we are only focused on first party data and first party data is becoming more and more important. There are often, these are often known customers or known potential customers, so they're incredibly valuable audience, but will be a lot smaller than what we usually deal with. Having a strong first party data strategy going forward is going to prepare you well for the future of digital advertising and give you a competitive edge. Our recommendation at the moment is to collect as much data as possible, collect email addresses and collect the correct permissions. This, so think about the, what data is useful and what data is going to assist you in your marketing efforts. As I said on the previous slide, first party data is becoming more and more important. It allows you to build direct relationships with your best customers by understanding their behavior and communicating with them as individuals on a personal level. With the need for first party data increasing, you need to think about how you can obtain this information. Users are increasingly more hesitant to hand over personal information. So think about what incentives you can offer in exchange for this kind of data. First party data is going to be an important asset for your business moving into the next generation of digital advertising. So get creative with how you can obtain that. Using data and machine learning, first party data will allow you to deliver hyper personalized ads in the right places at the right time, which is gonna boost your overall advertising performance. Finally, if done properly, it will allow you to understand your customers in great detail. You can learn who they are, what they like, what they dislike, what their typical customer journey is, how long it takes for them to purchase again, what products do they buy next? This data can then help you to feed your whole data strategy throughout the whole funnel. That's it from the paid media team. Thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, as Sam says, that, that concludes the paid media part of this. And I'm also very pleased to introduce our SEO transformation director, um, Haseeb. He's got a huge wealth of experience e-commerce and I'm really excited to hear what he's got to say today. Over to you, Hasib. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, very much. Uh, and I'm going to touch base on the experience um, initially. So over the last 15 years, I have worked on dozens of e-commerce brands, either in in-house roles, leading digital strategies for them, 
or being their growth consulting or advisory roles. Um, for today's session, I have picked about five key brands where at least we have had three plus years of engagement, some lot more, uh, either full in-house capabilities or advisory consultants, or in some cases, um, uh, I've been part of their growth journey from launch to see them to take the market dominant positions. Um, I'm going to share some of the learnings, uh, pain points from these growth journeys and how you all can apply some of these uh, or tailor it for your own brand's growth. All of these brands, uh, I will call them platforms or experiences uh, as, uh, as these are shaping some of the e-commerce landscape um, across uh, many verticals, especially the retail verticals, uh, which is becoming quite competitive as you have seen from previous slides. Uh, one common, there are a few commonalities on all of these uh, brands. Uh, all of these brands went through major transformations at some point uh, in the last decade with online channel playing a material role in their strategic uh, growth. Some of them were born digital native like Zalando and Book, Book Depository. However, each of them had unique problems for scaling and growth. Yeah. Uh, so the commonalities I would summarize as a platform being one of the key, the site of the size, most of them have multi um, domains, multi-regional presence with hundreds of thousands of pages uh, to manage. Um, so I'm gonna touch base on uh, information architecture and some of the growth strategies um, and how organic SEO played a part uh, in realization of the potential. So in the next slide, I'll touch base on, um, first of all, brands interact with digital content uh, with channels. I mean, on the left-hand side, you can see, at the end of the day, we all have digital assets, which is pure play content, and consumers interact with that content via various channels, whether it's mobile devices, your desktop, websites, or any voice channels. Um, and Brands are interacting with digital content and channels and journeys are becoming multiple touch points and over different channels. We understand that far more sophisticated digital experiences are central to the current and future needs of consumers. And with the explosion of e-commerce, this is becoming critical. So ideally, the main question that we have to answer, as all brands have to answer, is what consumer experiences we want to create. Uh, you have seen uh, the importance of various channels in previous uh, slides and uh, some of the key data points that the guys have presented. So in today's uh, environment, considering the consumer's entire journey is especially important where people's social needs, such as feeling or a sense of community will impact their buying habits as conditions of pandemic continue to change. One thing we expect here, I mean, this is this is a trend that is coming. John has shared the slide on the data across the regional. One one fundamental shift to what we are seeing is online shopping is likely to remain at high levels even beyond pandemic. So hence, all strategies and initiatives that the brand should aim for deliver from linear channels to immersive uh, seamless journeys. I mean, the diagram you see on the right hand side. Uh, it's a typical customer journey. I mean, users can interact from various channels. This journey can start from search on finding an ad on Google or finding a link on organic for their needs. They may go through various multiple touch points, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Even they do may do a product search on Amazon marketplaces. They may watch videos on YouTube and they may look at look at google image searches to find about the products and ultimately we have to satisfy the consumer needs in all of these touch points and ultimately i mean all of these touch points will contribute to the and which is a buy purchase uh, hence the next slide i'm going to touch base of the importance of uh, on the left hand side you see how teams or different departments used to operate and the lives of digital companies over the past 15, 20 years 
has even forced the traditional players across all industries, I mean, particularly retail, fashion, but across all industries to radically rethink their operating models. And all the points that the guys test before, that is for great, greater speed, customer experience and flexibility. Uh, so in our, when we are designing the operating models we are within the companies, what we are trying to aim is that there is no silo teams. The data, you have seen the importance of data across various uh, channels, the importance of speed, uh, the importance of uh, brand management. So ideally, the modern customer requires speed. For that, we need to have a combined digital IT brand data team all together. That team is focused on providing a fast speed um, and have the operational capabilities that are managing the needs of constantly evolving consumer. And we are able to touch, uh, we are able to meet the needs at speed at the same time, adding value at every touch point in the journey. So across all organizational size, even global, global big global companies, what we are seeing is um, there is an enterprise level agility coming in and most of companies are operating um, within instead of a silo teams in the past they are operating as one team which is co-managing all the business the it needs the data needs um, and we are moving towards more um, larger experience combination of in-house IT workforce is balanced with strategic use of partners and vendors. I mean, we, even the agencies, partners like ourselves uh, should be seen as a team that is working closely with all of the digital teams, the IT teams. Um, so it is not just imperative for brands to ensure that the platform or capabilities are managed, the operational capabilities are managed at speed as well. Uh, so technology and data function needs to or will play a very significant role uh, in formulating the business strategy. And in our experiences, what we are seeing is the most e-commerce chains have a technology-led business strategy, not a business, business strategy that is supported by technology. So in the next slide, I'm going to touch, I mean, this is a quite wordy slide. I'm just going to um, talk through in simple plain terms here. First of all, before embarking on a growth journey, the first imperative step what all brands have to take is understand where you are. I mean, there are multiple maturity models available in the market, up and down very simple combination taken from the best practices across the models, which is from level zero to level five. Level five is uh, innovation hub, your likes of Amazon's, uh, will fall into that where they're able to personalize, measure, speed, they're able to do tests on a daily basis and understand the customer's data, first party data, like we have seen uh, a lot of people talked about, and they have an agile culture where they are able to meet the needs at speed on a daily basis. Um, on the top, you see the vis SEO organic visibility and revenue maturity, on the bottom, you see it's more on infrastructure, maturity, the processes, the um, um, team, the operational capabilities. So ideally, to summarize, if you have a combined team, which is cross-functional, operating at speed, everything is available to every all the teams, and they are making joint decisions, and essentially they are managing the business um, and IT digital needs together, you will see we will reach the higher levels level three level four level five so i mean the previous plans what i've touched we all started at different levels um, some we started at zero some brands we started at four and we're trying to move it to level five so that gives that should give you a, before starting on this journey uh, is like start from where you are is like understand where you stand in the competition and and chart a one, two or three year plan to get to the next levels. Um, so in the next few slides, what I'm gonna talk about is um, a few key 
things that our e-commerce uh, brands need to utilize structure to win win the customer from an organic search perspective first of all information architecture i mean this is one of the key points uh, all e-commerce sites needs to optimize and i mean traditionally we have all uh, all e-commerce sites can be simply categorized into categories subcategories there are seasonal pages your buying guides your other promotion pages and then you may have subcategories and at the end of the day you have the products pdps what we call from a technical perspective like product listing pages which is your categories seasonal other pages and subcategories and pdps are your product detail pages in order to make sure your products are visible across all the funnel we need to have a link structure that cascades the authority from home page to your pdp pages so ideally this is the simplest representation of um, how the structure of the site should be built this foundation is quite critical in order to cascade like i said the authority from home page to the product page and you need to cater the needs of uh, customers across across all of the funnel and so this is one of the fun fundamental steps that in the next slide um, we talk about the faceted navigation and um, so faceted navigation nick if you can move on to the next slide yeah okay so again cascading from information architecture faceted navigation is one of the key key or most complex i would say and still in the present day nine over 90 percent of the big brands get it wrong and this can this can cause complex problems for site example i mean i've used the women's dresses here example we know typically there are about 50 to 60 types of categories within the women's dresses for example and if you further categorize and give users the filter option typically what we call facets and attributes you can see here if you have over 50 categories 20 different facet types five different sizes 10 colors it can easily cause a lot of indexation crawling problems for search engines for example one subcategory technically it's a one page and google can be able to crawl that 50,000 urls imagine if a website has 100 categories that would mean 5 million urls for google to crawl and this causes a lot of duplicate content indexation is issues it may not it, it is good for user experience to provide various facets but there is a technical elements in which we have to configure this rightly um we, we will be writing blog posts we will be writing some best practice guidelines on this one um so keep an eye on that uh, in, in order to make sure all your content is indexable in a seamless way and the main point is authority being cascaded down from home page to the product page in a simplest way and thereby allowing all your product all your content on your site to be found on search engines so the next tip next slide i'm going to talk about is uh, one thing i mean once you have the infrastructure onto the site once we have the infrastructure onto the site and sites are uh, architected correctly uh, you are ready from your satisfying the needs of demand of the customer um, e-commerce especially retail side uh, it's very seasonal led and i mean one on the right chart you see i've taken from one of my biggest uh, fashion retailer 70 percent of their sales come during the golden quarter um, and historically big black friday which was a u.s concept it it is introduced uh, into the uk market a uh, few years back it's becoming bigger and bigger and every year the sales during that one week of the black friday cyber monday uh, that uh, 10 days period the sales are increasing at an exponential rate this year we are expecting 6 billion of online sales happening during that week so plan for your uh, managing this peaks uh, uh, much advance uh, and by leveraging more on your first party data 
you can able to tailor communication emails or you can able to communicate uh, or provide some incentives discounts to the existing customers um, and able to meet the needs for the seasonal demands the sad part is still 70 percent of big e-com retail players are not able to meet their customers um, on their seasonal demands so you, you may have seen if you're jumping onto sites like curries or other other sites there is a lag period they'll make you wait um, a lot of it is to do with infrastructure setup um, amazon on the other hand where we work with book depository they are able to tap on the customer data so much that they are able to tailor the content the promotion on the day itself and the fulfillment infrastructure is there which john touched earlier on so long simple message here is you have to plan for the peaks much advanced potentially i mean all of the companies now have targeting their black fridays their christmas sales they they have planned their pipelines right now uh, so ideally the plan is to plan for this and year advance so in the next slide it's the summary slide um first of all i mean i'm expecting the e-commerce boom to stay and uh, and the trend and data from big players is coming most of our brands are heavily investing um, in the e-commerce uh, capabilities um, so the competition is going to go only uh, it will become more competitive so it's in, important for brands to understand consumer journeys and the next tip i said like come get combined all your digital it operations you should be setting up for success uh, but before you start on make sure uh, you do a full maturity assessment where you stand plan for one two or three year um, and where you want to be and don't ignore customers across uh, the all the purchase journeys so optimize for full funnel um, and lastly but the most significant if you want to mature into the level three level four and level five is the fundamentals your site should have a strong technical in place and it is imperative without that uh, in order to it will it is imperative to, to realize your full potential so yeah that is it from me today um, and if you have any questions please let us know fantastic thanks Asib. i mean we've we've landed pretty much at the top of the hour mm -hmm. which is quite impressive to the minute um thank you very much for the questions that we've had um i think just in terms of respecting everybody's time we said that we'd finish at 12 um so i think i think we should but please stay connected um check out our next events we've got some amazing content coming up over the next few weeks and into june um the team here have been really busy putting together all sorts of great information for you so, so please stay with us um keep engaging with us and, and learning as we go um and thank you very much for, for joining us see you all soon